of Shiloh Baptist Church, one church in two locations. I am so glad you decided to join us. Check out our program, check out our viral worship, check out our church in general. There are a lot of great things ha happening at Shiloh. Please go to our website and see some of the great activities that we are doing here uh, in our area. Some of the things that we are doing to reach people for Christ. We are a kingdom church who believes in kingdom building, who is helping to change people's lives. Check out the message today. Go to our website. Check out our other messages. We are so glad to make you a friend of Shiloh Baptist Church. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncan saying, have a blessed day.
Hallelujah. Lord, we give you all the praise. Lord, we thank you for coming and rescuing us. You didn't have to do it, but you did.
morning, praise God, and thank you for joining us here at Shiloh. We are so excited that you joined us. Thank you for letting us have our house in your house today so that you can receive the word of God. I need to tell you that we're going to be opening soon. Yay! Just like other churches. But uh, because some things are getting relaxed, we believe God is moving, and we're going to be opening our church. So those of you who have been joining us by video, it will not stop our virtual broadcast. We're just going to keep going, taking those higher. But also, go to the chat. Let us know where you're coming from. And uh, go to our website so you can see the exciting things we're doing here at the church. Call somebody. Because today's message, I'm, taking, I'm stepping out on faith and say, it is just for you. I dare you to say that. That's how you claim it. This word is just for me. Some people wait till it's preached to claim it. You claim it now. This word is just for me. Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. When you have it, I want you to say amen. I'll try to catch that and hear you here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. New Testament. In the epistles, 2 letter to the Corinthians. I'll begin reading at verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of the trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired for our lives. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raised the dead, who delivers us from so great a death, and doth deliver, and in whom we trust he will deliver. We're going to be speaking from this thought today. Stop being overwhelmed. If it ain't one thing, it's another. Uh, this message is designed to teach you how to stop allowing all the circumstances of your life to sweep you away from your faith and sweep you away from your power and how you can focus. Paul is going to tell us. I'm going to start this very important message and timely message with an amusing story I heard about Chippy the parakeet. Now, I heard this story first from Max Licato. And it goes something like this. Chippy the parakeet was sucked up, washed up, and blown out. He was sucked in, washed up, and blown out. This is how it started. The problem started when Chippy's owner decided to clean out his cage with a vacuum cleaner. So she grabbed the vacuum cleaner, took the attachment off the hose, put it in the cage, and just as she did, the phone rang. She turned to answer the phone, and before she could say hello, <sighs> Chippy the parakeet was sucked into the vacuum. Never saw it coming. The owner was so upset, she grasped, she turned the vacuum cleaner off, hung up the phone, opened up the bag, and there was Chippy covered with dust and soot, but still alive. He was stunned, but still alive. So she grabbed him up and rushed into the bathroom, turned the faucet on, stuck him under the running water to wash all the stuff off. And as she left him there under the running water, she noticed Chippy was now shivering and, and to his bones. She, oh, she did what any good pet owner would do. She grabbed the hairdryer off the shelf and blasted him with it. And Chippy never knew what hit him. Well, he was sucked in, washed up, blown out. A reporter that had written about this event called her up, the owner up, and said, how is the bird recovering? And she said, well, she replied, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. He just stands there and stares. 
I think that's not hard to understand if you get sucked up, washed up, and blown out. And that would steal anybody's song. What I'm saying is that some of us here, some of you listening to me, we have had those days where it felt like we were sucked in, washed up, and blown out. As a matter of fact, some people may have had weeks. Some people may have had some months. Some people may have lived some years. And some of you, it's unfortunate to say, have lived a lifetime of feeling like your circumstances, the stuff you were going through, made you feel like you were being sucked into something, washed up, all over, and blown out again. But the reality is this happens to everybody. None of us are exempt. And we find ourselves now trying to deal with circumstances that we don't understand. Please hear me. You know what I'm talking about. Seems like soon as life starts going along and flowing, something comes along to steal our praise, steal our contentment, steal our peace. It could be a health issue. You're sitting there in perfect health, and all of a sudden, now you are going through all of these tests. All of a sudden, you get this onslaught of health problems, and now you're some days feeling like you're a prisoner in, in the body that once belonged to you. And then, here's the kicker. You call your doctor to make an appointment because you feel like things are really going bad, and they give you an appointment a month and a half away. Like that wasn't bad enough, adding to your being overwhelmed. And if you go to the emergency room, even there, they treat you like it's not an emergency. How about financial problems? And I know they've hit us hard during this pandemic, trying to pay your bills. And bills aren't adding up. As a matter of fact, interest is adding up. Bill collectors start calling. Maybe you got some collection agencies calling, and you're sitting there at night losing sleep because you're overwhelmed by how am I gonna get out of this debt? Then you got some relatives that got a nerve to call and ask you for money while you're going through this stuff. Or maybe it's your children. Uh, you know, we have grown children who somehow seem to need us more and more the older they get. And they don't realize sometimes that they're adding to your problems because you got problems of your own. Now, I'm not trying to say be abusive. I know you love them, but I did say grown children. All I'm saying is all of these things hit you, relationship problems. Maybe you're in a relationship where love has packed up a long time ago and walked out the door and here you are now stuck in a loveless marriage or a loveless relationship or a non-affectionate relationship. You better hear me, I'm hitting somebody where they live today. Whatever the circumstances, we can all find ourselves there. As a matter of fact, it was Henry David Thoreau that repeated one of his famous aphorisms that talked about or described this situation. Here's what he said. Most men live lives, the mass of men live lives of desperate, uh, live, lives of, live lives of desperation. There it is. Most men or the mass of men live lives of desperation. What he was trying to say is that most men, most people resolve themselves to live in this desperate situation. And if you're a Christian by name, just because your name is Christian, don't mean that you're exempt from these trials. I mean, think about it. Look at the irony. How can your name be Chippy the Parakeet, and, which means you should be a happy something, but you get sucked in, washed up, and blown out? You know how? Because none of us are exempt. But if you are a believer, we are getting ready to tell Thoreau that he can keep that because we're getting ready to say that does not apply to a believer, not a, not a believer in name only, but a real believer. I wish I had somebody out there who could help me. Watch this. I'm talking about those of us that despite the ups and downs in life, the vicissitudes of our situation, we find ourselves holding on to God and trusting anyhow. I'm talking about those who have a testimony that when the light of your life, you better think back, went out, Jesus, who is the light of the world, came in and lightened up your darkness and lightened your load. I'm talking about those of us who had so many overwhelming situations, but we're still here. Can I get a I'm still here praise right now? Because that's going to mean something in a minute. And we're still here because we found ourselves or find ourselves sometimes like Jeremiah. Think about Jeremiah. All the things that happened to him that made him to be named in the Bible the weeping prophet. And we find out in that 20th chapter 
the ninth verse, a verse that we're all familiar with. Jeremiah was fighting so many circumstances, he was doing like some of us, putting on a show, but at night we were hurting. Inside, we weren't real. You better stay with me. Inside, we found ourselves not able to overcome. And he said in that 20th chapter, verse 9, he said, I said I'd never make mention of him. I said I'd never speak his name again. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I tried to, I got tired, I got weary trying to hold back. And pretty soon I could not hold back. Here's what Jeremiah was saying. That I got to such bad circumstances, but God is so real in my life. Anybody been there? When I don't feel like worshiping him, I praise him anyhow. When I think about how good he's been and where he's brought me from, I need somebody to wake up your memory this morning. How in the world are you going to sit there and say my fire's out? I dare you to start thinking about the last time God was there on your side, bringing you through, showing you that he was not going to leave you down. He said it was like fire. There is some fire. Shut up in your bones. That's why I don't let overwhelming circumstances take me out because I believe this morning if you are a believer that as soon as you get into trouble, it takes you right in God's will if you will learn how to worship in your trouble. I got Bible. Go to 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 5, verse 16 and 18. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. And in everything, give thanks. Because this is the will of God for you. Man, don't make me preach here. If you want to shake off what's going on and get back into God's will, I dare you to start a praise party right where you are, in your house in your car, on your job, whatever is going on in your life, he said, you jump right in my will as soon as problems come. But if you can keep rejoicing, if you can keep on praising, if you can keep on thanking me, God said, you're in my will. And where my will is, I will bring back that which you need in your life. There's no safer place to be than in the will of God. And that's why this week we're going quickly to this text because the Apostle Paul if anybody ever knew about being overwhelmed, Paul did, the writer of two-thirds of the gospel. Everything that happened in Paul's life, you will find out in this book of 2 Corinthians, Paul actually was, was irritated. The language shows you that he was overwhelmed, that he was upset. As a matter of fact, if you read the second chapter of this book, you'll find out that he said, I wasn't even going to show up. And he talks about the emotions he had as he was writing to the Corinthian church. This is a personal letter. This church meant a lot to Paul. He held this church dearly. And yet we know the Corinthian church was a jacked up church. What I need to say, and sometimes I say it all the time, I'm glad that those are the ones God is closest to because it's in my jacked up, messed up moments that I need a Savior. Somebody say amen. It's when I get to the point that I can't handle it. I don't need a God when I'm stable. Well, yes, I do. But I need him more when I'm messed up. And so he wrote to this church, and you can find out he's agitated. But then even in his agitation, he's going to give us the keys to how we can stand. What's interesting is this is really not 2 Corinthians, even though it says 2 Corinthians. Because we know theologically that Paul wrote four letters to the Corinthian church. But we only have two, which is first and second Corinthians. But chronologically, this would not be the second letter. And when Paul wrote these letters to the Corinthian church, the reason we know there's two books missing is because there are passages in first Corinthians and second Corinthians that allude to or talk about what was in those other books. But I believe when God allows that which we have, it's enough for us to be delivered. And Paul wrote to this church to defend his apostleship, to talk to them about the heresy of false teachers and about all the drama and mess that was going on in the church. 
I don't even have to tell you. Any Bible reader knows there was some stuff going on, some messed up stuff going on in that Corinthian church. And Paul wrote this time not just to deal with that and correct them. He wrote also to talk about, you know, defending who he was and how in the world could you do that when I'm the one that got you guys saved. So Paul started writing this letter, but then he gives us keys in this letter for how we can be delivered. What I hear Paul saying is, and what I'm saying to you as we take off into our points today, is out from this text. I like to believe the Bible tells us exactly where to go. What I hear him saying to you is your story don't have to end like this. Oh, that's anointing. This is not the end of your story. This is not the end of your song. I'm telling you, as long as you have God's word, you got one more card to play. You got one more move to make. You got one more eternal source that you can draw. Will you snap up so you can hear what I'm saying? Get out of that funk, whatever it is in your life. And remember, what we're talking about is you can stop being overwhelmed. This text is going to tell you, even in a situation where Paul was overwhelmed, he did not let it overwhelm him. He became an overwhelmed. Come, because what God put in us helps us overcome what the world is doing. You are an overcomer. Write this down. First reason that we are not overwhelmed, that we can make sure we're never going to get to the point where our circumstances overwhelm us, is we are not overwhelmed because we have God's peace. It's right there in the text. We're not overwhelmed because we have God's comfort. It's right there in the text. We're not overwhelmed because we've suffered with God. And we're not overwhelmed because we have God's deliverance. Let's talk about it. The first verse of this text says, and it's a powerful text. It tells us that um, blessed, well, it talks about Paul's greeting. He gives his greeting. And he says, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are at Achaia, grace be to you and peace from God, our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, grace be to you and peace from God, our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, in the Good News Version, that second verse says, and goodwill and peace, check it out, goodwill and peace from God, our Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ is yours. It makes a difference as you translate it. What he's saying is peace is a part of our inheritance. Peace is yours. What he's saying, first of all, Paul is writing to this church because after his greeting because it needs to be corrected. He's writing to this church who is in the middle of some mess and he's telling them the first thing they need to get out of that mess is to understand and realize that because you have an inheritance in God, the one thing Jesus won for you is peace. But here is what's different than what you hear about peace all the time. Peace is yours because God made it something that's already in you. What am I saying? We, I want to give you a different idea about peace today. We, we think peace and we want to quote Philippians, you know, uh, be anxious for nothing. And we try to throw on and tag on these little peace scriptures. But peace is never done in a vacuum. Peace is what opens the door to everything else God has. Can I tell you this? There is no way you're going to function in life and be a high achiever, be victorious, if you don't have any peace. Peace is the starting point that gives us everything else we need. Think about if you don't have peace of mind. Let's talk about it. Your, the importance of peace. It settles you so you can do everything else. Uh, you're, you're, when you're anxious, you, you mess stuff up that you won't mess up when you're calm. Uh, think about going or traveling to a place that you have not been to in a long time. And so you haven't been there in a while, but it's a place you know. So you put your GPS on, and as you're traveling down the road, um, you don't know if the GPS is leading you right. Scenery around has changed. Stuff has changed. And, and everybody in the car is talking and listening to the radio and talking about the fun when we get where we're going. But not you. You're sitting there now in this state of, I don't know if this is right. And this GPS may not be doing it right. So your mind is in another place. And then all of a sudden, you see a familiar landmark. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, we're fine. 
Oh yeah, I'm good. You've been there. Yep, we're going the right way. You know what happens when you find it out? You have a peaceful journey. Come on, don't make me preach that. Your journey is messed up when you don't have peace and God knew it, so he gave you peace first. Somebody say peace is mine. I'll give you another example. How about if you go to your doctor and your doctor tells you, I gotta take some tests because we don't know what this is, but it could be cancer. And you got Jesus and you're a strong believer and you're sitting there praying, but you're uneasy and you may even have some midnights where you're up and walking around, you know, trying to cast stuff down and you're worried about it and you want to know. And all of a sudden, the test results come back and you find out it is cancer. Watch this. When you find out it's cancer, all of a sudden peace comes into your life. You know why? Because you know now what you have to fight off. You know what you got to pray for. You know now you can get it on your knees and you can fight off and do what you have to do. Because once you know, peace comes in and you believe God is greater than the cancer. But the reality is you know it. So you can even shout in cancer if you got God. You can even shout when it's not good news if you got God. I know I got a witness out there. You can shout and believe. But once you know, that peace comes in your life. One more. Me and my wife got a call. Our youngest baby, our daughter, was in a car accident way down in Baltimore. We could not talk to her before we got in the car. We're driving down the road, two-hour ride. We might have done it in an hour and 20 minutes. I don't know. But we were flying. But we were flying upset. It was one of the worst rides we ever took. Can you imagine all somebody else calling you saying, you know, your baby's in the hospital and they wouldn't give you no more information? And we're saying, can we, can, we, can we talk to her? No. We get there and we see the car before we see her. That just heightened the anxiety. But when we got inside the room and saw Brittany, all of a sudden a terrible accident turned into a peaceful situation because once we got the peace of God, we knew we could move forward. The peace of mind is defined um, by dictionary.com as being in a place where you are safe and feel protected and secure. So what happens is that sounds like who we are in God. All I'm saying is even though the circumstances are bad, you're still safe and protected and secure. You got a God over top of you. You got a God watching out for you. You got God saying, this is no surprise to me. Can you please start shouting instead of crying and realize this is not a surprise to God? He didn't bring you here so you could fall apart now. God is saying, my peace is going to bless you. But we have to understand that peace is not this cute little thing. It's a weapon. It's mine. And I want my peace so I can fight my battles the way I need to fight my battles. I don't want some, some little idea of peace. I want real peace. Marion Webster's dictionary said, it's a place where you have a state of mind of calmness. And now I can go forward. Without peace, you may not survive. Think about Judas. It's because Judas sold Jesus out. And because he sold Jesus out, he did not have peace. He couldn't find peace. He couldn't find peace. So he hung himself. It was because Judas could not find peace after what he did because peace is a healer. Remember Prince, the artist formerly known. He committed suicide because he could not find peace. Check it out. 56 hours straight he was awake because he could not find peace. Peace. When you can't find peace, it don't make a difference how much money you got. It don't make a difference how fine your honey is. It don't make a difference how, what kind of car you drive. It don't make a difference how big your house is. Peace is a blessing. But the Bible tells us you have to pursue it in order to have it. Peter knew about peace. Peter, if anybody knew about being overwhelmed, Peter did. So a lot of Peter's text was about peace. Peter, I thank God, was somebody who could show us what happens when your life is just shattered as it happened to him at the cross. But in 1 Peter chapter 3, he was telling them what would happen if you need a good life. And in the 11th verse, he said, you must turn away from evil. You must do good. You must seek peace and pursue it. Ah, 
What did I just tell you? Peace is yours, but you have to pursue peace. You have to go after peace. You, you got to you see, peace is a weapon, but you got to live right for peace to come. You can't claim peace when you be messing up and doing what you want and not following God. He said you have to turn away from evil, do good, and pursue it. And then the famous verse in Isaiah, chapter 26, verse 3, we all quote this verse. It says, he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. But please don't forget the end part of that verse. Because he trusts in you. So Paul said the first thing is, you got to, Peter said, seek it. Isaiah just said, not only get your mind on him, but trust him. That's how you not be overwhelmed. I have peace because I trust him. Peace is yours. Next thing he said, we have the comfort. Of God. If you look at our test, we can't be overwhelmed because we have the comfort of God. It says, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. The Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Come on, we read too fast. The Father of mercy and the God of all comfort. That means there is no comfort God won't give. And if He is the God of mercies, here's what it's actually saying God does not worry about what we have done the problems we have committed how we have sinned he still comes along and gives mercy and since he's the god of all comfort he comforts us in our situation so that it does not perpetually overwhelm us but you getting your peace back have to now know i need my comfort how do you get comfort because god is the god of mercies and the god of all comfort what I'm saying is, I'm so glad God comes to us and he gives mercy. The word is the same word that we use for the Holy Ghost, uh, Paracletus, that he walks by us. He gives us generous peace. Think about Cain killing his brother, Abel. Well, let's, let's go before that. Cain gave an offering to God and God didn't accept it. Abel gave an offering and God did accept it. Now, in case you're not a Bible reader, the reason God didn't accept it, because God told them both what to bring. And that's our problem now. We want to bring God what we want to bring God. <laughs> Hello. But God told him what to bring. But watch this. He was sitting there sulking and angry and even thin, had in his heart how he was going to kill his brother. You know what happened? Watch this. God showed up, not to Abel, who he favored his offering. He showed up to Cain, and he gave him mercy. He said, Cain, why... Are you so disquieted? Why, why are you so upset? Why is your head down? Why are you so sorrowful? He said, if you do right, you will be accepted. Listen to mercy. Mercy tells us, I know what you did, but if you fix it, I'm ready to take you back. He said, and, and, he's this. and then he comforted him by letting him know sin wants to have you. And if you're not careful, you're going to be caught up in sin. Come on and fix it so you can stay with me. That's the comfort of God. He lets us know that he's still on our side. And don't just think about Cain. We look at Cain and say, man, that's bad. Uh-uh. God did the same thing for us. How many of you out there are honest or glad? I know you're holy, but you're glad. I know you all, you know, you got it all together and you got your favorite Shopping shoes and shopping clothes, and you can't wait to church to get back because you're ready to show people how holy you are. But how many of y'all are glad that God has given you mercy for some of the things that you've done? Some of those things we messed up on, that God didn't turn his back on us. He was right there with us. That's what I love about God. He blesses us in our worst situation. That's why the prodigal son, remember what happened? God had mercy on the prodigal son, and he allowed him to come back home and even gave him, you know, he slew and had a party for him and got him a new ring and a new robe and all that. But watch the real thing. The Bible said the prodigal son came to himself, got up, and went back home. Stop, stop, stop. Don't miss it. He came to himself, and when he did, God was still there. Hallelujah. God hadn't gone anywhere. Can I help somebody? God is still there waiting to lift you up with comfort and mercy. You just got to turn to him and make up your mind and go back to yourself. 
He's the God of all comfort and all mercy. He comforts us in all of our comfort. Then he said, and plus, now we can give others comfort. You know why we can give others comfort? It's not because we're so good. We just can't wait to tell somebody how good this God is that we serve. You know how I can tell if you're authentic in your belief in Christ? You tell folk about your God. Because anything good we have, we like to tell people about it. And when you start talking, there's no way God can't figure into your conversation. Either you tell somebody, God forgave me. Let me give you an example. The, the, the woman at the well from Samaria. Here she was, sitting there. And Jesus showed up, found out, knew she had all the husbands and was now shacking up. Jesus knew what was in her heart, but he showed up anyway, sat there with her and he gave her a drink. Turn your life around. She found him, went to see all the people and said, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Because when you get comforted, you can't help it. But then. And they went and saw him in that 42nd verse of John chapter 4. It says that they came and said, hey, now we don't just serve him based on what you said. We have seen him for ourselves. Anybody know that's the best thing in the world? When I don't have to live off somebody else's amen. If you, if you live off somebody else's praise, somebody else's praying for you and praising it, somebody else, look how they shout. You better realize you got to get it for yourself. Open up your mouth. Open up your mind. Claim your stuff. Quit sitting around talking about what somebody else got. I've seen Christians, they watch people and say, look at their anointing. God is no respect to a person. The same anointing they have, he's placed a measure of anointing in your life. So God said he is the God of all comfort. He comforts us every time we go through trials. God is there. Then it says we do not have we are not overwhelmed because we suffer. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, verse 5, so the consolation abounded in Christ. Watch this. This is the jackpot. This is the one we overlook. This is the old forest for the tree stuff. Folk get so, no matter how many messages you preach to them, people get so caught up in suffering, they don't realize that suffering is the blessing. Suffering leads to a consolation in Christ. They don't realize it's because I suffered that I'm able to act like I act. You know how I can stand and worship? Because when I give my worship, it's not coming from a place of softness and ease. It's coming from a sick bed. Can I get a hallelujah? It's coming from a hard time. Can I get a praise the Lord? It's coming from a crazy night with a crazy mind where I thought I was going to die. So when I keep praising, it's because I can say, been there, suffering made me stronger, made me better than I ever was. We miss the fact that the text says suffering in Christ is also the consolation of abounds once I suffer. Now follow that. A, a consolation prize is the prize given, even if you don't win, it's given to you for participating. Oh, this, this is good. What I'm telling you is because you suffered and trusted, because you suffered and held on, because you suffered and read your Bible, because you suffered and cried, because you suffered and messed up, but you came back and repented, because you suffered and did all that, God said, here's your consolation prize. Every time you suffer, you get something. I get smarter. I get stronger. I get wiser. I get, uh, 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 Bolder. I, I get to the place where I look at the enemy and tell him, I wish you would, because tonight I'm prayed up. I look at my circumstance and say, that does not shake me. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The consolation is, when I got up off that bed, I was better than somebody who had never been on the bed because I understood suffering. Paul, throughout his life, suffered from his conversion where he had to be let down the basket in Galatians. Remember that? Because men were trying to kill him. To God, which I didn't understand, gave him a thorn in the flesh to keep him from being caught up in the revelations. And then in this same book, in chapter 11, Paul was defending his apostleship. And then he starts talking in verse 5. I want you to see this. He starts talking in verse 24 of that 11th chapter. And he says, five times Jewish leaders 
hath beat me with 39 lashes. Three times, Roman officials have beat me with clubs. I was stoned one time. Three times, I was shipwrecked, left for dead. I was shipwrecked and I was in the, I was in the sea for a night and a half. Can you imagine being in the sea? for a night and a half. He said, because I travel, I was always in peril. He said, I was in peril of robbers. I was in peril of my countrymen. I was in peril of other folk. I was in peril of the sea. He said, I've always been in trouble. And he goes on and on, showing that it was the suffering that made him who he was. I'm not telling you to wear your suffering like a badge. I'm saying quit wasting your suffering when you get to a new trial. Act like you don't know you just came out of some. And then Paul was able to tell them in this same text that we, God has to, to help us suffer so we will lead a straight life. Experiment was done that if you blindfold a man and tell him to walk straight, he will walk straight for a few steps and then start going either one way or the other way. And pretty soon he's walking in a total zigzag or he goes around even in a circle. And this phenomenon has been repeated over and over. And, with, and what they found out without a fixed point that you can see, you will live or you will go crooked. But the worst part is when you're blindfolded, you think you're going straight. Preach, Pastor. Here is what I'm telling you. You think you're going straight, but you're really going crooked because you don't know what God is doing. So what happens is you walk around straight. You walk around crooked until God allows something to happen to straighten out your life. Suffering. A loss. Straightens your life. Sickness straightens your life. Death straightens your life. All I'm saying is some things drive you back to God, but you're going to lead a crooked life without fixing your heart on God. And at the end of that, in the fourth chapter, Paul was able to tell them, here's what happens to me. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 through 10. He said, now, because I suffer, I'm troubled on every side, but I'm not in distress. Ooh, somebody's out there right there this morning. I am perplexed. Sometimes I'm confused by what God's doing, but I'm not in despair. I am persecuted. I don't know why God letting this happen, but I'm not forsaken. I am cast down, but I'm not destroyed. How did Paul get to that? I'm not destroyed. How did Paul get to that conclusion? Because he suffered enough to know the reason I won't be overwhelmed is because I have suffered. And he ended that fourth chapter, one of my favorite scriptures. For these light afflictions, which are but for a moment, bring us a greater hope of glory in God. While we look at the things not seen, and we look at the things why we don't look at the things seen, but we look at the things not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things not seen are eternal in heaven and God. All this saying is I get so much suffering till my view turns from earthly to heavenly. We also are not overwhelmed because of God's suffering, his peace, his comfort, his suffering. And let me close this. His deliverance. That was the main point of the text when I read it. Verse 8, Paul said, I don't want you ignorant about the trouble that came with us. Here's Paul coming, telling them he's a big time apostle, but he said, I don't want you ignorant. I had some trouble come on me. And three things happened. I was pressed out of measure. I was above strength. And I feared for my life. Pressed out of measure, above strength, feared for my life. Paul said, it happened even to me. But, and that's the turning point. We had this sentence of death in us. Let me explain. Paul said, but well, I have suffered so much. I've seen God do too, too much. I'll sit there. I'd rather fight than switch. I'd rather hold on than quit. I'd rather smile while the circumstances look like they destroy me. I'd rather stand my ground than give up. He said, and that means that we should not trust ourselves, but trust in God. May 2000, uh, excuse me, 2019, there was an airplane that crashed. It was an article in USA Today. 41 people were killed. Here's what's interesting about the article. The 41 people that died, it says that when the plane crashed, 
witnesses in the plane said that the evacuation would have went smoother and faster if people were not trying to grab their carry-on bags and grab their stuff before they left. An AFA official said, wait a minute, we don't know how many lives would have been saved if people would have just got out, got delivered, and, got, got, and maybe left their bags where they were. And he was saying, but people died because folk were trying to get their stuff and get out. Do you know why Paul said we had this sentence where we trust in God and not in ourselves? Because you can't trust you for your deliverance. You got too much baggage. You carry too many things with you. You go back and try to get the wrong stuff. When you think about being delivered, you got some unforgiveness in your heart. Think about being delivered and you got some fear running around in you. Think about being delivered and you got some habits you can't break. God said, you got too much baggage to try to deliver yourself. But if you trust me, I will deliver you. And then Paul gives us the threefold deliverance of God. Ooh, read the text. It says, and we thank God. We're setting before you a God who has delivered, celebrate is delivering the air you're breathing now and will deliver. That's why I don't get overwhelmed. I got a God who has delivered me. I got a God who is delivering me. And I got a God who will come on, celebrate with me. That's the place for you to go off. That's a shouting moment right there. He will deliver you because of those first two. He has and he's doing it now. And he will keep on. The reason we're not overwhelmed because God, Jesus, is our answer. When Abraham took Isaac to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him, he experienced, you know, he had to be overwhelmed, kill your only son, but he experienced Jehovah Jireh, the God who will provide. Need provision? God is the answer. In the Gospel of Matthew or Mark, you'll see many sick folk came to Jesus. Look at the 15th chapter of Matthew. And it says, Jesus healed them all. He's our healer. But in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus said, the reason you don't have to be overwhelmed, come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke is easy. My burdens are light. You'll find rest for your weary soul. That is how we stand. Can I tell you what God is telling me to tell you? Stop. How in the world are you going to be overwhelmed? We got God's peace. We got God's comfort. We've already suffered for God. And we sure enough have God's deliverance. God bless you. As Pastor Duncan saying, go to our website. Check us out. Join us. God is going to make sure you learn how to not let anything that will negative overwhelm you. God bless you. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down but with no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living just existing. Well, and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free I tried it for myself and 